We're back. We're back. Me and Adventure Dog got up five o'clock this morning and left to go fishing. See if we couldn't catch a steelhead and maybe film some underwater. And uh, kind of sucked. Had all my batteries. I used two GoPros, and I used a GoPro for filming for here now. And I uh, had all my batteries all charged up last night. Had all, all the GoPros in this case, which I bring. Batteries and the GoPros in here. Got up this morning and then uh, left all of my cameras on the counter. That sucked. <laughs> that sucks. It makes you really makes you realize just how much you love to film it, as opposed to catching a fish. It's almost like, well, why, why am I even going? But I didn't even know until we got there, obviously. But anyways, quick update on that. Um, I know we didn't get any fish. Drizzled rain overcast. It's about an hour's drive. Maybe a little more on Logan Road to get to this river. I think I've ran into people on this river maybe four times total. Um, over a couple few years, right? And at the head of the river is where I had that branch snap and saw the light in the timber. I saw the big cedar branch raise up, back up from the ground across the lake last summer. And I just left. And then about a mile farther down from there is where I used to sit on that big, those big logs across the, the old road. I sit on those logs surrounded by the big timber. And then the one time I just couldn't sit there. I had to leave. And that's just a mile down, right? And then probably about, um, what is it? That's 40-something kilometer. 50 something 10 kilometers farther down is where a few um first nations friends have seen these beings on the freaking side of the same river and then that is about where they seen them is maybe one two three four bends in the river away from where i catch those steelhead and I share the video with you guys oh so anyway so right there Right at that same spot, you guys see me catching the fish. When we leave, we have to go across the river into that timber that you see when I'm fishing, right up there. And uh, so we park about a mile and a bit up the river, jump through the forest, and then hike down the river. And then hike back out to the logging road, and then walk all the way back on the road. So today, we fished. Hiked, fished, hiked, fished, hiked. Got all the way down to the bottom spot there where you normally catch fish. Nothing there. And then we climbed across the river. Hiked across the river, climbed to the bank, and went to the timber. So we started going through the timber. We heard a, a loud howl. It sounds like one of our chickens. Sorry. Sounded like a howl. Combo with an elk call. There's fresh elk track everywhere. I mean, they are everywhere right in the bottom with us. But they're not bugling. This is springtime. And there's only one long one, kind of. And then another, and then it stopped us. The thing is, it stopped us both dead in our tracks. And Ruby went like this. And we're both stopped looking in that direction. Hold on a sec. Oh, it sounded like one of our baby chicks was out there. It's not. So anyways, as soon as we stopped and looked towards the sound, which was across the other river, it sounded like it was up on the hill. And then, um, I don't know what it was. It wasn't a wolf. I couldn't, there's no way it was an elk. But whatever. It was a long call, but it's far enough away that it is what it is. I don't give a shit. Well, as long as it's over there, I don't care. But then, Ruby looks up in the trees and goes, Rrr, and starts barking and growling, staring up into the freaking trees. I was like, what? Come on. I'm not in this shit. And I'm looking up into the trees, too. I didn't see nothing. But she was locked on something, man. Holy cow. And it's funny, on that note, um, sometimes I was, I, now that she's she starts coming on adventures with me, especially when I'm fishing, I know when I'm fishing there, I like to just concentrate on the water, what I'm doing, and not be bothered. And if somebody or something is going to sit and watch me, have at it. Just leave me alone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I don't need to see your face. I don't, I'm not into it. But anyway, so that happened today. And then here's another one. One of these things, I might as well share it. Even though it doesn't mean shit, but I noticed today. So the last time I went, 
as you drop down this long hill and you can look across. Actually, I think it was two or three videos ago, I sat on the bank and you can see behind me timber and some logged off area. Two or three videos ago, whenever it was, a week ago. And then um, when I'm coming down that hill, it's right at kind of first light, I was a little bit late and I can see just across the valley. So so across the valley is on the, the little logging cuts in the side of the, the timbered mountain. And right below there is where I fish in the river, right below those log dop cuts. And I remember glancing over, you're flying along and glanced up. I'm like, holy shit, that's a big black, that's a big black stump in that clear cut. Because that I, I didn't notice before. Because I'll tell you what, and a lot of you people out there listening to me right now are going to, you're going to be shaking your head. Uh-huh. When you can't stop looking. When you're driving in the country. <laughs> the highway, you can't. You'll never not be looking ever again after you've had to eat this freaking reality sandwich to, that you didn't order up once you see one of these beings you, you don't stop you can't stop yourself and if you think if you're gonna say you can you're kidding yourself you can't especially when i was living in whistler pemberton you drive the sea to sky highway i know every single rock slide there and i'm always looking at every single one of them every single mossy bluff up in the timber you can't stop yourself but anyway, I, uh, yeah, it was about a week ago and I was a little bit late. And I remember, recall seeing that big black, I thought, I'm like, because you just drive along and look up. Oh, wow. Whoa, what was that over there? Look at that big, I've never seen a big black stump like that there. Because you driven by there a gazillion times. Anyways, I intentionally looked for the big black stump today on the way back. It's not there. <laughs> of course, it's not, right? There you go. There's my update. I know it's a hotbed area, but I love fishing. I'm not going to let anything take that away from me. And I love fishing there. As long as I mind my own business and not ask for anything, I hope I should be left alone, right? Now, what do we got here? Good day, Steve. Hope this finds you well. I have a couple short experiences to share from Pennsylvania. Hmm, Pennsylvania again. First two stories are from my older brother in the early 60s. His first story was of seeing a large dark figure, excuse me, while driving at night, across the road in front of him by a railroad bridge. As he neared the bridge, he slowed, stopping on the bridge. He looked in the direction of where the figure went. What he saw sent chills down his spine. Something very large, dark and tall, was standing on the bank by the railroad tracks, staring back at him with glowing red eyes. He sped away as quickly as, the, as quickly as the car would go. His second story was of an evening that he was at his cousin's house. They had a small farm in the country. As he was leaving one evening, his car stopped as he got to the end of their lane. He got out and started to walk back the half-mile lane to the house. Okay, I guess he meant his car broke down. The moonlight was enough for him to see. Cornfield to his right and fenced pasture on his left. As he walked, he could hear something in the corn moving beside him. There was no wind, so he knew something was in there moving with him. He started walking faster, and so did it. Finally, he ran as fast as he could, and it did too, with corn stalks flying. That's such a shitty thing to do to innocent people, you know? And that's when he saw those red eyes through the corn stalks. He thought he was going to die as he finally saw the farmhouse. He ran in, sweating and panting. Cousin asked him what was wrong. Before he could answer, the door opened, and in stepped our uncle, and he said... What are you doing outside at night, boy? My brother explained the car had broke down, but never told him anything else. My story is shorter, from the late 80s. We lived in a two and a half story house built into the hillside with the basement exposed in the front. One evening I was looking out the second story bathroom window that faced west. I could see the hillside as it rose above the house in the rear. There was a dusk to dawn light at the rear property line between the neighbors and our lot. I saw something big and dark coming down the hill very low, almost crawling. 
doing what people call a spider crawl. It was moving towards the back of our house. As it entered the lit area, before the bright spot of the light, it stopped. It then stood up on two legs, turned my way, and looked at me. At least I think it was looking at me. I think it noticed or felt me looking at it. After just a few seconds, it turned and started running back from the direction it came. The first few steps on two legs then appeared to drop down on all four as it disappeared into the darkness. Last I ever saw anything. I'm 69 now. I started with you for hunt stories a few years back, and now my wife and I look forward every day for more shares from you. Keep up the great work that you're doing for the people, Steve. Also attached a photo of a stone my wife found on a hiking trail. I told her it was a gift left for her to find. Happy trails, man. Best regards to you and Sarah. Jeff and Jean, retired Tennessee now. Oh, there's another email. All right, I copied the email twice. <laughs> there's the picture of the rock. It's a different kind of rock, isn't it? Different kind of rock. Looks like a kernel of puffed wheat, <laughs> right? Yeah. The more it's typical patterns, the pacing, what a shitty thing to do to someone, you know? It's funny, you know, I don't, uh, lots of people say, oh, we gotta leave them alone, just leave them alone, give them their space and leave them alone. No, they gotta leave us alone. <laughs> it's a two-way street, right? We're not pacing them in the in the forest and tormenting the shit out of them at nighttime and just flashing glowing red eyes at them in the nighttime for kicks like they do us, right? It's a lot of, I'd say every single person here is an innocent person that's wrote in. They haven't done anything to anybody. Didn't ask for this shit. All right, I am thinking I'm on four hours sleep or something. I'm beat. Let's keep going. This is titled update hold on a minute appreciate you sending that in sorry i forgot to thank you for that if i did i'm a little cross-eyed here today but i appreciate you sending that in man if you got anything else you hear anything else keeps sharing it or encourage people you know to speak out loud all right because we're getting every single freaking person heard no matter what i don't give a shit how repetitive it may be for some people here that's not the point of the game the point of the game is listening to every single person no matter what. Hi, Steve of the Round Table. My name is David Smith. I sent this in a good while back. It's only, it's only short, so I'll resend it again and then give the update. I live in rural North Herefordshire in the UK. I'm country born and bred and have worked the land since I could walk. I spent a lot of time in the woods doing firewood, making charcoal. I'm a shooting man with a good eye for movement and a sixth sense to match, which was sharpened by working with hundreds of horses. I know when I'm being watched and know when a fox or a deer, etc. is behind me. And every time my wife fell pregnant, I knew before her. And even the sex of the child. And that with two, there was a problem. What? I hear that again. There's no... Hold on a minute. I know when I'm being watched, and know when a fox slash deer, etc. is behind me. And every time my wife fell pregnant, I knew before her, and even the sex of the child, and that with two, there was a problem. <laughs> I've been doing some I've been doing some of squirrel shooting from a hide onto a feeder. Alright, sorry, is it me? Is it me? I'll slow down. I've been doing some of squirrel shooting from a hide onto a feeder to get rid of some of the gray squirrels that take so many of our UK bird life each year. Squirrels eating birds? I've been climbing to the feeder for his last taste of food and was about to squeeze a shot off when he froze and stared to my right. It was then I was aware of the silence. You could hear a pin drop. Not a bird singing anywhere which is not normal. I slowly turned my head to the right but couldn't see anything until a small movement caught my eye. There was a slight 
haze in the trees about 50 yards away. I stared at it for several seconds, and suddenly it moved away from the two ash trees it was standing by. The closest description is, like many others have said, it was like looking at a scene from the Predator movie. It's almost, it almost matched the background perfectly. There's no feeling of fear, threat, or voices in, in a mind, which I have had before when warned of pending, pending danger on the road or at work, but it was almost like a dream. I did look at the trees. I did look at the trees as it walked past. So I could see one to get a height estimate and went back later that day. Its height was between seven and seven and a half feet. That's pretty creepy, isn't it? Update. I have a dog, a Podenko, P-O-D-E-N-C-O, a Podenko, who is, ups, a, I'm, I'll guarantee I probably pronounced it wrong, right? <laughs> Who is obsessed with hunting. Anything from a, from a mouse to a fox to chase ravens and even aircraft. Nothing puts him off. He's always way ahead of me. I take him a walk most evenings. And he does his thing while I hang back. Well, after that sighting of the Shimmer Man, he started to act funny some evenings. He will hang around my feet, tail between his legs, and ignore anything that rustles in the hedge. To be quite frank, it's bloody unnerving. No doubt. No doubt. I can't take it now and I have to turn around for home. I don't know what he's sensing or heard, but whatever it is, he is scared of it. Well, the one night we were out with my wife in tow, when he started to act funny again. It was just after that that we heard what I thought at first was a fox. But as it got nearer to us, there was something odd about it. Really odd. Its call was not right. It was way louder than any fox I have ever heard. And it had a strong hint of the howl from the werewolf in an American werewolf in London mixed in. It sounded absurd. But we knew it wasn't a normal fox. It got closer and put the wind up us so badly. We turned and walked briskly home with the dogs not waiting to see what was going to happen to us. A couple days later, I saw a neighbor and asked him if he had heard it. He had not. Only heard it, sorry, he had not only heard it, but had seen it. He reckoned it was way bigger than any dog he'd ever seen. And it put the wind up him as well. The wind up him, that's a, a UK term that North Americans won't be familiar with. Put the wind up him. I think in Canadian, it might have meant scared the shit out of him. <laughs> now, a friend of mine is the biggest skeptic with most things and usually makes fun of me. He lives 25 miles away as the crow flies. I told him about this when I visited he and his wife. He raised his eyebrows, looked at his wife and said, tell him about it. She went on to say that a few weeks before, they had just gone to bed when they heard a fox as it got closer, they couldn't make out what was wrong because it sounded funny. When I had said about the werewolf howl, it had rung a huge bell. That was exactly what they had heard. It had gone a bit quiet, and then the security light had come on in the garden. She jumped out of bed and peeped through the window, only to see this huge German shepherd-sized fox standing in the middle of the lawn, just a few yards away. She beckoned her husband over, who has shot many fox over the years, to have a look at this monster fox. And he was amazed at the size. But then called out again, and they realized it was the one that had been barking. A vixen called from a way off, and they said this fox took off straight for it. It cleared a five-foot fence almost completely, with no effort at all. Normal foxes always scrabbled over it, but not this one. He was in no doubt that this was not an ordinary fox, but has no idea what it is. It's rather disturbing, and I have started to get very nervous of what is out there. To see one is to see one is weird. Creature is bad enough, but two is getting too much. I don't know where these things are from, but the only conclusion my friends and I come up with 
is portals. I've got to sage that. I've got to the stage that if someone said they had seen a T-Rex, I would not doubt them. There's something going on. Be it by the government, aliens, or just nature taking a funny turn, but I, for one, don't like it. Kind of regards, David. P.S. Don't read my name. <laughs> P.P.S. Only kidding. I don't give a flying fig who knows my name. Truth is truth. Okay, man. Appreciate you, David. Apologize if I stumbled a few times. I think I'm half awake right now myself. This is the first time I've sat down since 5 o'clock. I'm just feeling pretty good. Now, that sounded like just a... Uh, this sounded like a canine, solid canine type of thing. And I don't know if you guys have access to trail cameras or game cameras, motion activated cameras that we use in North America a lot. A lot of outdoors people use them. A lot of hunters use them. So I don't know what's up in the UK, if you can order them or not. But if you can, and you and your, your neighbors, if this is some kind of just typical canine being, not one of these upright people that we predominantly talk about here, I would suggest that you guys go get a bunch of meat scraps from the butcher. And uh, the stinkier the better. It doesn't matter how disgusting, how rotten it is. If you want to, throw it in a cooler with some water and leave it outside in the heat and let it turn into jello. Anyways, and then uh, dump all that shit in one spot in the woods where nobody's going to find it, hopefully where there's no domestic dogs, and put some trail cameras up and keep feeding that bait pile. And if this is some kind of abnormal canine that isn't supposed to be there at all, but it's got to eat, it's not going to be able to say no to that pile. It won't be able to say no. And you'll possibly get a picture of it. Unless it's something absolutely supernatural, then probably not. Probably not. What else? Um, I f remember I had to share a funny with you guys. I, hold on, what do we got here? Um, when was that? A uh, kind person sent in their experience. They were looking downhill. And he went down there and stood there and stood up, put his hand above, and stood where the the Sasquatch, the Sabe person, the forest person, whatever we're gonna re you want to refer to them as, I don't really give a shit, was standing there looking up, looking up at him. All I can see is the top of his head. Now follow me. And I read his story and showed the pictures, shared the pictures. And one picture he said clearly, he said clearly in the video, I made this picture to show you what it was that I could see. <laughs> and immediately after I read that part, I, I looked at the camera and I said, it doesn't matter. Even though I just read his words clearly that he made the head himself and put it in the picture to show everybody what he saw. I said, it doesn't matter. Somebody's probably still going to freak out and say, it's fake. You can see, you can tell it's fake. Well, he just told the audience that he made the picture. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like anyway, sure enough, I went and I checked those comments intentionally to see how many people would say that. And there was a handful. It's like, it's amazing to me. It's amazing. I'm not, I'm not angry. I'm just saying it. But it is amazing to watch us as a species fumble along through this lifetime. It's such a bizarre thing to witness and be a part of yourself. When you're aware of a bunch of shit that a lot of typical humans aren't. <laughs> you know? Stuff that you say online. Things that you do and you say it clearly. And it's just amazing to me how many human minds gap out like full gap out i don't get it i wonder how why why is that how is that you know it's a shitty deal because that characteristic can be a easily be be um people who are intelligent and dark probably know of these various char character flaws in humans and have figured out recipes and how to capitalize off of that obviously right but it's weird to watch people do that you know, what the other day I was saying how uh, the world has just admitted there's an absolute famine with 2 million people in Palestine. And I said, that's pretty crazy, right? It's pretty, I said it's pretty um, cruel to do what they're doing to any species. I mean, even people in jails. 
If there's 10,000 people in a jailhouse, they're not going to sprinkle 500 meals in there and watch them go at it. And that's what they were doing to these innocent people, the innocent ones. And I said, man, pray for the innocent people. And then, of course, by accident, I see the I see the uh, comments. The YouTube comments show up on my phone, but I rarely I just stay away. Because I don't know why, when I have glanced at it, it's always the one in a million or whatever it is, absolute douchebag commenting. And then I see it, and depending on my mood, I'm like, what'd you say? <laughs> I'll go at it, right? Like the other day. Some guy opens up, and I, I know I'm rambling, but why not? I've been in the woods with the dog half the day. And uh, that's all I said. Pray for the innocent people, man. Pray for the innocent people. Some guy opens up yesterday's video and says, oh, you're not waving the Palestinian flag today, Steve. <laughs> like, really? That's what you took out of a famine of a couple of million people starving to death, fighting over crumbs in the streets in modern human times. And we urged to pray for the innocent people. And that made somebody mad. Fuck. Crazy. People are crazy. There you go. People are crazy. Not all people. It's just too bad. It's too bad. It's too bad the crazy people, the angry people have access <laughs> right here as well, right? It's too bad. Now, moving along. This is titled They Can Learn. Hmm. Hi, my name is Alan, and you can share it. My dad, Bob, who has passed away a while back, he and I met up with Dr. John Bendernagel back in Courtney in the early 2007s. We were in the doctor's house looking around at all of his footprints casting and other evidence, and John asked my dad was a believer, and my dad said, yes, I've seen them in a, in a couple of times in my life. John asked if he could take my dad's statements, times and places. My dad's first time was in the area of Boston Bar in the early 1950. He was in his early 20s. He and his brother Lawrence and a friend, Rudy, were gold panning at one of the rivers in the area. When he looked up and across the river walking through the willows, which were, which were about six to seven feet tall, sees a head and shoulder. End of email. Ends. Damn it. All right, um, I'm going to have to mark this as search email. <laughs> I don't normally miss on copying email, so Alan Baumbach. Alan, if you're watching right now, send in the rest of it. If it was you that missed the other half, and I will search this later and see if I screwed up and did copy it, because I really want to hear this in my backyard, right? Damn. Just getting, it's just getting warmed up there. Okay, on that note, uh, Vancouver Island. If anybody out there has, um, if anybody here either has first hand, second hand, or knows somebody who has seen some of these or one of these forest people anywhere near. Hall's Boathouse, Mount Finlayson, the Malahat, Goldstream Park, the Victoria Highlands, Humpback Road. Email me. Email me what you know, okay? Please. Please email me what you know of that particular area, all right? And that's very, very close to where I had my experience. And I understand... I heard through someone, I forget where, that there was somebody who had their boat in Saanich Inlet at Hall's Boathouse, and they had their spotlight on the boat, and they spotted three or four of them in the water, holding onto the rock, trying to freeze like they weren't there, and saw them. I'd love to hear from those people. I smelled the smell on that end. I smelled the smell on the east end, would it be east or north end of Humpback Road? And then I went away. My grandfather, who saw one of these beings, used to live right there at Goldstream Park and behind Ma Miller's pub. And a uh, female RCMP officer had three or four of them walk across in front of her car on that end of Humpback Road as well. Right there. Uh, what else? Anyways, that's what I was hoping to hear from. And that 
sheer face that goes down to the ocean. That's where I was retrieving that deer when something was coming ripping up from the water end. With my buddy, we were kids, and we took off. Anyways, okay. I keep forgetting to say things, and I'm remembering a few things now. Please, if anybody knows anything of those areas, please email me. Email it to me. Share my story at howtohunt.com, all right? Response to your March 9th video and about the good guys. Hi, Steve. I completely feel what you are saying in my soul. I live in the United States and the corruption in this country is mind-boggling. Canada is even worse. A good guy army? Question mark. Well, I truly believe people can only fight back spiritually through use of energy. It may sound crazy, but I've always felt that the way to overcome the negative is by overturning it in another realm. For example, there are think tanks, remote viewers, stuff like that. Somehow we would all need to pray the same prayer at the same time of the day or night. Prayer is focused energy. We could focus our thoughts and power. I don't exactly know how, but I'll bet we could do it. But a physical fighting army, we will lose because the evil has all the money and the weapons. And that type of fighting feeds the demons. We need to attack them spiritually because you're right. There's an attack on humanity and we are all energy. So the physical act starts in the unseen realms. Hope this makes sense. Let's do this. Lee Taylor. Lee, everything starts with a dream, right? And then it just takes action to make it come to fruit. So, shared. Get the ball rolling. Somebody take the wheel. Drive that bus. Get it going. Get it going. I got a lot I could say on that topic, but I'll try to bite my lip right now. I'll say one quick one. <laughs> you know, if you do, if you're, if you are following what's going on around the planet, which I do, and when you think about how much money the clowns from North America and a bunch of the other Western governments have sent in to fund the war in the Ukraine, now follow me. If you see how much money they have sent, and if you're aware of the border, the front lines, the borderline of the war. And when we realize just how stupid the American and Canadian leadership is, it's almost a valid question to wonder if, do you think they're sending all the money to Russia by accident and they don't even know it? <laughs> right? Say, Biden, you idiot! You've been depositing at the wrong account the whole time. Right? All that money. And the... The front lines just keep creeping right across the Ukraine. It's almost like they have been sending it to the wrong side of the war they intended to. And they're so stupid. It's a probability. Okay, sorry, moving along. Prayer is a good thing, for sure. Physical fighting? Yeah, it doesn't do anything, does it? I'll tell you what, if some of those elite trained guys would just get together and do the job right, you know? All right, this is titled, Yowie's Like Drumming 2. I heard today's story say, forest people like drumming and music. Well, this triggered a memory for me. I used to hold a drum circle and love meditation up on Mount Nebo, near Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, in the Boombana Race for Rainforest National Park. There's a nice big circular fireplace with concrete seats encircling it that safely contain the fire. A small group of us of us, would meet up and meditate on love for all things and then play drums and cook up a big pot of chai tea. There were good times. At the end of one of our meetings, there were a few of us just chilling around the fire and one of the guys got up to take a leak and he took a dolphin torch but had not switched it on. As he relieved himself on a hoop pine tree nearby, well, he heard a stick crack on the other side of the tree and switched on the torch, shining it at the ground, expecting to see a possum or something like that. But instead, he shone the torch on a big pair of feet covered with red hair. He slowly raised the torch beam 
till he reached the head at seven feet tall. And when the light reached its eyes, they shone red like a dog or something. But it was clearly a yaoi, covered with red hair, a pointy head, no neck, watching us from the tree line. Well, he came running back to us at the fire, completely freaking out, and said, We've got to go now, and explained what he just saw. I had heard at the time that they were more like gorillas, and mainly ate leaves. So I said, don't worry about it, he's just checking out our drumming, probably. There's no sign of aggression, chill out. But the bro could not handle what he had just seen and left us there. Enjoying the fire and good, and, and, sorry, sorry. But the bro could not handle what he had just seen and left us there, enjoying the fire and good company. His loss. Aha. True story. Since then, the rangers have removed that fireplace, closed the nearby campground, and there's no longer camping permitted on Mount Nebo, which sucks. I have friends who live nearby, (coughs) excuse me, and they also, they have also spotted yaoi's around the rainforest up there. It's rare to hear stories because of ridicule, but if you ask the locals there, they're all right. And email. There you go. I got a, you know what? Just for, uh, I'll have a funny feeling that if you went there with the flashlight torch yourself and saw the same thing, the chances are you've been hightailing it too. (laughs) The chances are. There's a big, big difference between talking to somebody who's seen and seeing yourself. And we are talking a world of difference. The wood booger in West Virginia coal camps. You know, it's kind of funny when I say the wood, wood booger. Or it's the booger. I grew up where boogers was snot balls in your nose. (laughs) That's what we grew up. The only thing the word booger was used for was that. (laughs) So every time you hear... There's boogers out there. It kind of makes me laugh. And I'm not laughing at the person. I'm laughing at... There's boogers in the woods, right? Anyway, sorry. I need some sleep. The wood booger in West Virginia coal camps. Dear Steve, I never encountered a Bigfoot myself, but my mother did. I was only a child when this happened, but I vividly remember it. I will recount this experience to the best of my memory. I was born and raised in southern West Virginia coal camp in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. I may be prejudiced, but looking back on life, I realize that we grew up in paradise. I desperately miss my West Virginia hills. Been in those hills. The fresh air, beauty of the mountains, and breathtaking vistas at every turn. When we were kids, before the electronic trappings of today, we entertained ourselves playing with each other, and those beautiful mountains were our playground. We regularly played Tarzan, swinging in the grapevines. We head to the woods for a game of hide-and-seek or replay the latest TV episode of Daniel Boone. We knew the location of all the best berry patches and morel mushrooms, wild greens, roots, ginseng, apple trees, chinquapins, chinquapins, C-H-I-N-Q-U-A-P-I-N-S, never heard of that, as well as many other nature's bounty outside our door and we visited them regularly. Even raised a garden in the rich mountain soil and had a few chickens. Looking back, we had a culinary out our back door. We were not wealthy in material things, being children of poorer coal miners, but were rich in so many other ways. No one in the coal camp had much more than the next, so we didn't realize we were considered poor. Life was good, and we lived it to the fullest. Well, they do say the... uh, The highest suicide rate is with the rich. And the happier people are, on average, are the people with less. Believe it or not, that's the poll. Our dad worked at the local coal mine and we shopped at the company store, which was a stone's throw from our house. We lived in the former superintendent's house on the hill overlooking the company store. The houses along our street were the best in the community, being the homes reserved for the coal for the mine managers because these homes were elevated on the hillside to overlook the miners' homes in the coal camp. Our house butted up against the forest. Dense woods surrounded us from behind our home to the top of the mountain and we explored them regularly. 
My story is not my own, but my mother's encounter with what I am now certain was a Bigfoot. My mom has long since passed away, but I can remember this event vividly. I'll try to recount it as best as my memory. This was around July of 66, a year before the Patterson-Gimlin film of what became known as Bigfoot even surfaced. It all began on a warm summer's day when my older brother, who was around 15 years old, and my older sister, age 11, and the youngest, about 8 years old, decided to walk around the strip mine road above our home to look for blackberry patches. The local coal company had discovered a seam of coal on the mountainside above our home and strip mined it a few years earlier, leaving an indelible scar on our beautiful mountain. The strip road left behind was an invitation to the coal camp kids for many, activity, many activities and mischief. We knew if we found enough blackberries, Mom would treat us to one of her wonderful blackberry cobblers and maybe some blackberry jam for enjoying later in the winter months. So off we went with our baskets in hand to see if we could find enough blackberries along the hillsides of the old strip mine road. Our dad had recently been injured in a mining accident and had a full leg cast, just one of the many injuries he sustained in a mountain bump in the mine. In a mountain bump in the mine. In the mine, sorry. For those not familiar with coal mining terms, a mountain bump, or sometimes known as a pressure bump or rock outburst, is when a sudden release of pressure from the weight of the overburden of the mountain occurs. This most often happens when the mine is deep under the mountain with lots of overburden and solid sandstone mine roof that doesn't fall as you that doesn't fall as you retreat mine. Any old miner will tell you that you want the roof to fall as you retreat the mine to relieve this pressure. When you don't when you don't get the roof to fall Mountain bumps sometimes occur, which are sudden, violent release of pressure and in the weakest coal pillar. These occur most often in the western United States. But due to the huge mountains and deep mines in southwest Virginia, we often had mountain bumps too. That's a horse. <laughs> Not me. We often had the mountain bumps too. The reason I know about all this is because I worked as a coal miner with my dad and went on to become the very first female coal mine inspector in the United States way back in 81. But that's a story in itself and for another platform. So back to the Bigfoot story. Mom decided she wanted dad to drive her into town to shop and run some errands. She told dad he would have to drive her to the start of the strip road so she could find and retrieve us kids to go along with them. The strip road was too rough for our old 67 Pala, and she would have to walk around the road until she found us and bring us back to the car so we could all go to town. So Dad drove her as far as he could and waited by the car on his crutches until she retrieved us and came back to the car from our trip into town. However, unknown to Mom, he had walked to the end of the strip road and taken a path cut the woods which led back down the mountainside to the road on which we lived. We just make a big loop around and headed back home with baskets full of luscious blackberries. And meanwhile, Mom traveled to the end of the road and noticed our footprints in the dust, which led to the footpath to home. She figured we were probably back home by now, being that there was no means of communication back to our dad on the other end of the strip road. She had no choice but to walk back the way she came to dad waiting at the car. Mom said as she walked back, out the road, she began to hear something really big moving through the woods on the mountainside below the strip road. She said it sounded really big, like an elephant working its way through the woods. She could tell it was bipedal and kept in step with her as she walked. When she stopped, it stopped. When she sped up, it did the same. Curiosity finally came, overcame her fear and she climbed up on the berm to get a look under the, under the hillside. A berm is a raised bank of mound of earth spilled on the side of the strip mine road to serve as a guardrail to prevent trucks and equipment from running over the edge. So my mom climbed up on the berm to get a look below and hopefully a view of what was following her. 
Heavy undergrowth and mountain laurel covered the mountainside, obscuring her view, and she could not see anything. She said to add to her terror, everything else in the woods went dead silent, which unnerved her even more. All she could hear was the mirroring of her footsteps. No birds, squirrels, or insect sounds. She climbed back up on the berm a few times more to try to get a look at what was following her, but to no avail, or so she said. By the time she got back to the car, she was in a run, yelling at our dad to start the car. He obviously wanted to know what was wrong, and she told him something really big was following her beneath the hillside. She told him to just she told him to just get her home so she could make sure her babies were all right. When they got home, we kids were all there proudly displaying our bounty of blackberries on the kitchen table. Mom thanked the good Lord for providing protection to us and bringing us all home safely. Our dad, who was a miner, hunter, and woodsman, simply stated it had to be a black bear. Mom adamantly exclaimed that thing was no bear. She never told us what she actually saw. From that day forward, she forbid us kids from playing in the woods ever again. I can still hear her shaking that willow switch, daring us to let her catch any of us up in those woods. She said if the wood booger didn't get us, a timber rattler or copperhead would. And for certain, that switch would be waiting on us when we got home. We never went back to play in the woods except when we had an adult with us. She never spoke of this day anymore or ever came clean about what she actually saw. Looking back, I'm certain that was a Bigfoot following her and mirroring her, mirroring her walk. The numerous accounts of sightings that regularly occur in West Virginia and the Appalachian Mountains only confirm this for me. And this event occurred nearly 60 years ago, but we never ever forgot the day our mama was almost taken by a wood booger. Fast forward from 1966 to now, and I've finally made it to my retirement years. Unfortunately, I'm battling cancer. That sucks. Sorry to hear that. So much for my retirement dream, such is life, but I have time to do the things I want, including listening to your podcast regularly. Thank you for shining light on this issue. We all know these beings are out there. And also thank you and Sarah for using your subscription fees to feed the hungry children in your area. You're good people, and God will bless you for your good deeds. I try in whatever ways I can to help homeless, hungry, and forgotten people and animals that most of society would prefer to look away from. When you have walked in their shoes through your own life, they hold a special place in your heart for their plight. I also thank you for taking us on your adventures and sharing the beauty of the mountains and the forest around your area. My husband lived in Sparwood, British Columbia, for 10 years. I must say, aside from my West Virginia hills, that area is one of God's most beautiful creations. I was in awe of the beauty of Banff National Park and the snow-capped mountains reflecting on Lake Louise. Cancer may have stolen my plans to travel in my retirement, but I can still remember in my mind's eye the beauty of those places I visited. So please continue to share in your adventures and share the truth of these beings. We all know they exist. Sincerely, Linda Racevich Parsons. Linda, I appreciate you big time, and I'll guarantee you, you're about to receive possibly 50,000 prayers for better health as soon as everybody hears this. Probably the next, in less than 24 hours. So prepare to be healed, <laughs> maybe. You never know, right? The power of prayer is huge. No matter how, no matter what your stance is on Various religions, doesn't matter. The power of prayer is huge. So anyways, I hope everybody throws one towards our kind lady who shared with us this interesting email. Interesting to me. I appreciate you sending that in. That was well wrote, well written about the time of life, right? I've been in those hills. I can only I can only imagine what they must look like in autumn. It must be just mind-boggling beautiful, all those rolling hardwood hills, right? There you go. The patterns should stand out now, don't they? All right, here we go. Mark, this is red. 
50 year old memory returns. Dear Steve is doll. Use name no problem. Oh, I've written up most of my experiences. Last night I had another memory recollection. 1972 ish. I was riding my bicycle home from Hatzik Prairie. H A T Z I C Prairie. Hatzik Prairie. Is that going to be near Prince George or something? There's a jog in the road at the end of the straight stretch where uh, East Running Road heads off. The road I'm on heads into Miracle Valley. Used to be a dry out place for alcoholics. Anyway, right there on the road in front of me is two hair covered people. Black hair in the five to six footer. Brownish red on the younger, smaller one. Faces rimmed with hair, like fur in a parka hood. I think a female and a child, but at the time, I don't know what I was looking at. We paused, observed each other for 10 to 20 seconds. It was very confusing. The dark color one's face was black, like a very dark-skinned African person. Big black eyes. The younger one also had big black eyes, but tan skin on the face. The one moved off to hiding behind the row of trees. Seemingly disappeared. The next thing I know, I'm straddling my bike. The hairy people are gone, and I'm frozen in shock. I was there for at least 20 minutes after they left. Disappeared. A car came, honked, brought me out of my trance. I moved off the road, but still stayed there for a few more minutes. The memory of seeing them was scrubbed. I was puzzled. What the F? I'm staying in this spot unmoving. Last night this memory returned. I've been meditating about healing and truth. I thought I had total recall, but what do I know? What will seep out next? I don't know. Time will tell. I send this to the round table to tell how these things manipulate our memories. When they're in your head, it can be disorientating. Dori disorienting. Sorry. Phil Hooken. Phil, appreciate it, man. Is it them manipulating our, manipulating our minds or is it our shock doing it to us? Right? Gotta wonder. Is it them or is it us? What else do we got? All right, this one is titled, this is big. It needs to know information. It's, it's need to know information for everyone. All right, here we go, you got us. Steve, first let me say thank you for what you're doing. It's been very helpful for me and I know many others. I've had five encounters with Bigfoots or Dogmen. I don't know what they are. I only seen this thing with my eyes once. And when they interviewed me, Mufon and the BF Garbage O, they told me what I saw was a Dogman. I thought, what's that? My encounter was in 2007 in Mercer, Pennsylvania. It was September 7th, daylight. About a mile from my house on the north side of the road, I saw a tree spinning. Like it was being hit by a dirt devil or a cyclone. I was heading home in the truck. I thought to myself, no, it's not that. It would be bouncing from tree to tree. It was just one tree being shaken right off the side of the road. So I started to slow down my truck. My eyes went from the top of the tree down to a giant hand that was holding onto the tree and shaking it in a circle. I stopped the truck and got out, and when I stepped out onto the road, I looked down at my foot while I placed it on the ground, and then I stood up to look at this thing, and it was gone. And behind it was really thick foliage that had been opened up like a rhino went through it. I didn't hear anything. I could smell it, though. I say it smelled like wet dog, early morning cow poo, death and skunk all mixed together. Could you imagine if we read off every single person's description of the scent? It would almost be a, a comedy, in, in a way. But it was, uh, everybody's pretty, pretty good in the descriptive, right? 
I'll read that again. Sorry, guys. I say it smelled like wet dog, early morning cow poo, death, and skunk all mixed together. Before the truck came to a stop, I got a really good look. My eyes went from its hand to the peak of its head, then to the center of its shoulders. Its hair was a reddish brown color. The hairs were three or four inches long. I could see the sun glistening off its skin through its fur. His shoulders were every bit of four and a half to five feet wide. It was about three feet taller than me and I'm six feet tall. It had a conical head and pointed ears. Oh wow. Pointed ears. The ears struck out to me. Stuck out to me. Sorry guys. The ears stuck out to me. They weren't like the ears in the Patterson-Gimlin film. They were big at the bottom and then got thinner at the top like a dog's ear. Right along the road, there's a swamp that gets fairly deep. It's pretty good fishing in there. The next day, I went back to look for prints or something and realized this thing was standing in a culvert, which was two feet lower than the road. Two or three foot lower than the road, which puts this thing at about 10 to 12 feet tall. I can't begin to describe how gargantuan this creature was. It was very bit of it was every bit of 1,200 pounds, every bit. And the muscle definition, bigger and tougher than any bodybuilder you've ever seen. Take those guys and quadruple them to match its size. Anyhow, to get to the need to know information. I just want to say, sorry, I just want to stay on topic to begin with. I need to give you a little backstory. In the early 2000s, they started reclaiming the sewer water. In the 80s, they tried to start to do it. And the tree huggers stopped them. Well, I've been fighting them ever since. They started reclaiming the sewer water, complaining, going to town meetings, almost getting arrested, dealing with the semantics. And they play with you. And practically going mad over it. I think I, I grew into a tree hugger. I maintained my composure and just paid my bills and complained every month. But a few months after my sighting, I had another supernatural experience. I'm a pretty spiritual guy. I was ordained in 89 as a minister of Christ. The mob ordained me to open a church. Once I got my credentials, they told me to open a church and they were going to give me a bunch of money to hold on to, to handle the health insurance for the Teamsters Union. The Teamsters, sorry, the Teamsters gave the mob $60 million to help them with their health insurance for the Teamsters. They were pretty smart with money. The point is, when he told me that he wanted me to open a church for his money to be tax free, I declined. He was really upset. He went through some steps to get me to be ordained, and I don't know that's what he wanted me to be ordained for until after I was ordained. Sorry? And I didn't know that's what he wanted me to be ordained for until after I was ordained. You see, I had already read the Bible. I was only about 20 years old, 21 years old at the time. The Prince of Peace version was the first Bible I read. And, well, it states that one cannot have two masters. One cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon being money. I mean, it went against my religion to do that. What you wanted me to do. But this is needed to know. I need to get to the point. After seeing the Saba or dog man or whatever it was, I got closer to my father and my Lord and Savior Jesus. And I prayed for him to prepare a place for me. Right when I prayed that I saw a dark shadow entity. Right when I prayed that, I saw a dark shadow entity leave me. Not me, but my area, quickly. Like it was taking the word to the Father. And on a Friday afternoon, I remember this because Obama was in Pittsburgh at the time for the world leaders' meetings for peace. I remember saying these words while walking from my dining room kitchen area into the living room. Quote, I feel the spirit and I don't like it, end quote. Turning the corner into the larger part of the living room and seeing the rest of the living room, there he was standing in my living room, 
inside of a stone archway. My Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Yahweh, Jesus Christ. Also sitting on my couch to his left was a dark entity. I couldn't make out a face or nothing. I could just tell it was a man shape. It stared at Jesus the whole time. Never looked at me. I was looking at Jesus and looking at the entity. And I was thinking, what is that, the devil? Then Jesus started to speak to me. But his lips didn't move. But I heard him. He mentioned my ex-wife's name and was going to say something else. But I threw my hands in the air and said, You're not going to preach to me about that. He just stared at me with a disappointed yet quite a loving look. We stared at each other for a few minutes. No thoughts were in my head. I just stared at my Lord and Savior with awe. Then he dis dissipated. If you've ever seen the Green Mile, when coffee takes the bad stuff out of the people and then releases into the air, like a bunch of nanobots or something, it looked just like that. The stone archway was still there, and the entity was still there on the couch staring at the archway. Never looking at me. Well, that dark entity was the Father. Jesus stood at the right hand of the Father, and when I sat down in my easy chair, I sat on the mercy seat, and he started to judge me. I wish I would have fell flat on my face in front of him. A couple minutes passed, and the stone archway dissipated. Then a couple more minutes passed, and the dark entity dissipated. But my brothers and sisters, this is not yet the need-to-know information. Although that is pretty need-to-know. Jesus lives. Well, let me go forward to 2019. COVID hits. 2020, they came out with the first inoculation. And I found out that they had lead graphene in the vaccines. This is probably going to get us uh, deleted. So, all right, hold on a minute. 